Evening, everyone. Uh, today, I'll try to add up on what Dan was talking, or to be exact, I'll try to give you some uh, insights in a project life cycle or details about the phases and processes we went through while building an application for one of, one of our clients using the uh, Preact and Web Components. So quite an interesting thing. Uh, also, I'll give you some tips and tricks how to use some more complex or fancy things like custom UI kit or integrate custom fonts, how to create uh, or optimize a build configuration for deployment of such an application and show you uh, uh, something about event meters, which Dan said that I will explain you. Uh, and at the end, I'll give you a few suggestions and tips you could take on when starting your next project, whether it's something similar or, or project uh, web, web or mobile development, it doesn't matter. And of course, brag a bit by showing the application uh, we implemented. Uh, before I start, so my name is Vedran. Uh, I'm uh, part of a JavaScript team from Zagreb. I've been working for Infinum for about, I think, six years now. I've used a couple of different technologies from React, Next, React Native, Vanilla JS, now back on React. So that says that I've failed them all and I'm back at the start. Uh, okay, enough uh, jokes. So before I show you some interesting stuff, at least from my standpoint, I would like to say a few words about the key point of the talk and that's, that's the widget. So what are those? So you, I'm probably, you're, I'm sure that you've probably all seen something like this. Use them on a daily basis. Some of you maybe built similar things. And they became a part of our everyday life. And we take them for granted, as we should, of course. But what are those from a technical standpoint? So if you dig a bit, you'll see that there are third-party application embedded as a standalone feature. In other words, it represents an independent or self-contained component, which can then easily be in integrated into specific systems to provide some functionality that system is lacking. As any other technology, uh, they have their own pros and cons. So for example, here are a few pros where they improve UX. How? Basically, they improve your app functionality, interactivity, so regardless of the type of the widget you're trying to integrate, well, your website or your application will do something they couldn't do before. Uh, and I found an interesting philosophical term about the widgets, uh, where it says, widget holds the power to both decrease support volume while increasing customer engagement. So think about it by the end of the talk. If you figure out what that means, please tell me because I don't know. Uh, also, they increase your site traffic. So widgets basically encourage, uh, encourage your users to stay longer on your web page, which increases click-through rates. What that means, so basically your website is more useful. So more people are engaging uh, on it, so it, it enhances customer experience. So by increasing that site traffic, you can analyze it and use it uh, for some different business purposes for uh, either improve your business planning or decision making uh, in the long run. Apart from that, uh, customi customization. Well, I would say that this is uh, both attribute of a good and a bad widget. So what it means, so of course, in a good widget customization would be that you can style your application according to needs of a client, whether they have custom team or some custom uh, styles that they want to apply so that their app or your widget doesn't stick out on, on their uh, web page. Another thing is uh, ease of use. So instead of building, uh, spending time and resources building like this in-house for something you need, well, it's probably much easier to take something which is more than often plug and play and it will cover uh, more of your needs. And at the end, uh, you have one less thing to worry about. Uh, another thing is also productivity. So by adding those additional functionalities, your application is automating a bit of functionalities it's doing. As well, it leaves your time 
to be focused to implementing something else. And as I said, you don't have to worry about maintaining uh, such an application. Of course, there are certain cons, performances. Well, uh, what about uh, performances? So uh, performance per se means that whether the widget can be either large in size or holds too much business logic. So it can either ruin your uh, client's SEO. For example, if you are embedding an application which is like five megabytes, probably the time to paint of their website can be decreased as well, which will at the end Google take as a penalty, etc. Uh, also GDPR, uh, one expensive buzzword today, but most of the third party applications and widgets per se integrate with some other services and most uh, usually those services are something like analytics. Today, most of those analytics is questionable are those GDPR like approved or maybe you'll use something which will at the end cost your client more money than they learn. Uh, also accessibility. Well, I don't know about you, but I've met too much application where accessibility was put aside or at least set as a last item on our to-do list or in any to-do list in order to implement some, I would say, more profitable feature because accessibility doesn't bring that much profitability, which is, I don't want to say what. So please don't do that. So try to put accessibility like at least uh, in a bucket list when you are implementing this and, uh, and do it. Like I said, customization, well, in a bad widget, what customization means, well, you won't be able to style it. It will stick out, uh, it will have some custom themes, custom styles, and when a client with a nice application embeds it, so it will hurt the UX uh, they have. So when doing something like this, try to keep up with a, uh, with a case where you will leave the UX of the application you are bending at least on the same level that it was before. And security, like I said, more than often they integrate with some third party services. Try to not help anyone break either your widget or the client website by creating the side entrances or side door by abusing the API or anything else they, they are using. Uh, okay, so. Uh, what it took to build the project that I'm going to show you. So first thing as any other project, we started with some draft or client had an idea on a business problem they wanted to solve and some guidelines how they wanted to, to solve this. And first or of many requests was they wanted their application to be easy to integrate. What they didn't know how to word technically is they wanted this application to be uh, framework agnostic just by saying, okay, we want this app to be embedded on our client website, which is in WordPress. We might have another client which has, I don't know, Next.js application. So make sure that it will work on any technology that our third uh, or our customers might use. And at first they came with an idea uh, of building an application called Button. So I don't know about you, but when I'm writing something in my CV, I don't want to write as an experience I implemented a button. So at least, I don't know, I like to exaggerate a bit and write something that I actually don't know. So I'll talk about it uh, a bit more. Another thing is, so they wanted this button to be performant. So what it means? So it means that they wanted that application size was small enough so that loading and displaying inside those system doesn't, like I said, stick out or pop out from other parts of the website. As well, it doesn't hurt the SEO of the related website since most of those websites would be some marketplaces which uh, is largely imp impacted by the SEO uh, performances. Uh, another thing, secure, should not introduce any uh, services or issues which could hurt both our widget and client's applications. Widget could, should have some brand theme, so they wanted to use their branding. Uh, since we have another large application built for them, so they wanted to reuse the theme that we already built. Widget should be customizable, 
at least to one point and reuse existing API. So this is an interesting thing since for the other application we have, I would say, an API which is behind a closed infrastructure so you can't access it from a public standpoint. And we have to reuse it or at least part of that for an, a widget which is going to be public. So it was like a fun, I would say, learning experience at least for our backend team. I don't know if I should call it fun. So how to enable part of your API or uh, backend to be accessible both publicly and both privately. And at the end, don't impact or that it doesn't impact the performances of both the UX, the bigger application that we have and the widget uh, per se. Okay, so after the initial meeting uh, where we uh, heard all the client uh, requirements, what we usually do, we have two phases. One is called discovery, other is called refinement. So first one is used mainly to get a higher level overview of the feature we are going to build or the application. We should, we try to detect some potential risks and at least try to get some rough estimations for the development and of course define some questions that we have for either the client or the third party services uh, or the third party uh, client that we are going to uh, integrate in. Okay, after all of those questions and things are answered, uh, we start with the refinement and what it is. So basically, we start with more detailed work and that's that uh, we try to break down the features or application uh, into a detail. So write all the necessary tasks or tickets, I don't know if you are using Jira or whatsoever, so that basically it's ready for development and then of course provide more uh, detailed estimate of the work at least to I would say 10-15% uh, uh, buffer. And at the end, uh, our architecture diagram, so after the discovery and refinement, something like communication and architecture diagram of the button looked something uh, like this. So I would say this is one of the complex buttons I've built. And this is a design we had. So basically you had some initial view where you would click that on a marketplace and then you would get a whole model where you can choose different initial payments, durations, so uh, either choose like fixed or variable uh, interest rate, and basically in a few different steps get a whole uh, informational offer or for a leasing, that for a vehicle that you wanna lease. And after we've seen all that, uh, my basically suggestion was to call it something like this. So if I call it like this, it will look like I built something for Pentagon and not, uh, not a simple, simple uh, button. Okay, after the discovery and refinement, we had a, or we have a tech workshop. So if there are still some questions to be answered, at least from a tech standpoint, so this is uh, where we would organize such an event, uh, where we will try to uh, answer those questions, see a feasibility of implementing something like this, or if we don't have much experience in building such a project. So we'll organize a tech workshop where we'll have, I would say, all the relevant senior members included, just because they've probably seen something similar, they've run into some similar issues. So we'll try to minimize all the risks and basically get as much, uh, much uh, data as we can. So. Uh, I don't know, but this seems expensive. So there is also, a, I would say, a much, much more cheaper way to do it, and you've probably done it as well. So why not just throw away the whole workshop and write something like this? You'll probably get a similar answer, which will cost a bit less. Well, no, don't do it. Uh, what? are the key points of those uh, tech workshop. Like I said, we will try to analyze all the client requests. Why? Well, sometimes, like I said, non-technical requests from a client will point you in a technical direction you have to take, or at least define the, some implementation path uh, that you'll follow. Also, we'll try to discuss possible development approaches. So, Rarely there is a single way of implementing something. And we also try to give more different 
approaches to the solution to our clients so they can also choose and be a part of the part of the whole process again identify and minimize the risks like i said more than often someone worked on similar projects so why not use their input to provide so they, they can provide us with the experience about the issues they had or maybe the best practices we should follow uh, and similar and of course at the end define the define the tech stack so We'll try to find the best fit to the project, having in mind multiple parameters like uh, requirements, team experience, uh, team availability, etc. Okay, now an interesting stuff. So, what we choose for our project was Preact uh, as a main main. I wouldn't, wouldn't call it framework. I would call it a UI library. We use Vit for a, for a bundler. Uh, we use Chakra UI as a UI kit. Since we already used Chakra UI on a previous project, so we could just easily transfer like components and team we, team we already have built. And we used SVR, I don't know if you heard it, fancy set of, I would say, hooks and utility, which, can, which will help you with data management and I would say uh, fetching. Okay. Uh, well. So, uh, you all probably seen what lazy loading is, how to use it. So why introducing lazy loading in the whole story? So if you've seen the design, we had like an initial view and then few like models or wizards like step with a couple of wizards. So what we wanted to do is uh, optimize it for the, for the performances. So, so why to ship the whole application at once where we can maybe create some initial view which will have only what it needs to display the, the card or the button. And then let's load the other parts when we actually need them. In order to do, the, to do that, we used code splitting, which looked basically like this. So we had initial view, which was first chunk, and then main view, which was then split in different chunks, like every step of the wizard was chunk uh, itself. Here is a list of dependencies we needed for the whole project. And if you are building something similar and you're not aware on how large it is, well, you can easily find that on bundlephobia.com. Just enter the library name and you'll see uh, how big of a size it is. Also, you can get, you can load your package JSON and see like how much the whole like uh, project setup actually weights. So I told you about uh, lazy loading and chunking. So in order to display something like this, we just said, okay, we're gonna use regular CSS to style two different texts. So what we need is just SVR for data fetching or data management and a preact to actually load, load the initial view. On the other page, well, we had a bunch of different things. So here we'll introduce our UI kit. And if you, if you see it, it's quite large one. So it uses emotion in the background, which is like 400 kilobytes uh, per, uh, itself. So we'll load that, let's say, in the first step. And then in the step where we need forms, we'll actually load libraries like date picker, select, like form library, uh, utility for da uh, dates management, uh, and et cetera. OK, but how to do it? So these are like examples on how lazy loading works in different uh, React-based, I would say, libraries. So you can see how it looks in React, in Next.js, and in Preact. So fairly similar, you have a lazy function which uh, accepts a loader, which is basically a promise. And what it does, it defers the loading of, let's say, this other component uh, until it's needed. So, and that would be okay if our Preact uh, team didn't say, our Preact team didn't say, well, lazy loading is fine, but this feature is experimental and you shouldn't use it in production. Well, tough luck, so what to do now? Well, uh, lazy loading is nothing special. It's plain old JavaScript, so you can implement it by itself, at least the, the, the skeleton or uh, fit it to your needs. So we implemented something called lazy, fun lazy component, which accepts a loader, which is the same like import. It has a loading state, so you can pass it some, uh, uh, here you can see like loader with a height of 300 pixels. And then at the end, when the loader is being done, it will just render or return the, uh, return the component. 
and it worked, uh, it worked perfectly. So we didn't have any issues across any major or any browser since JavaScript is compatible with any browser you have. Okay, build configuration. So this is, uh, I would say, a bit interesting. So we used Vit, and for the whole project, so the architecture was too complex, but as you can see, like the build configuration is like 15 lines of code, so nothing, nothing too complex. So I won't go into details like line by one, line, by one, line. Uh, I'll just show you two important parts. One is the copy public directory. So if you have some custom images, fonts, etc., so you want to transfer those when, when building a project, so this is a must. And another one is a roll-up option. So what it is, uh, Vit in the background uses roll-up for bu bundling your application. So why did we change this? Well, when you are shipping some kind of a product or a application, it has to be embeddable in other websites. So you want that process of deploy and update to be as seamless as possible. So that's why we had to name or remove the hashes. So you will probably build something and when you build an application, you'll see name, uh, hash, etc. So we wanted to remove those hashes. So as you can see, we defined that entry names, chunk names, and even asset file names will be without any hashes. Uh, so if a client like this impo imported our entry file, so uh, from the, uh, let's say, AVS or wh wherever it's deployed, so since the path name will stay the same on each build we do, so if we build an application, the next time the index.js will be called index.js. So the next time on the deploy, what client will automatically we, will be handled by the latest version of the application itself. So they don't have to change uh, the import themselves, redeploy their application. So basically the whole process gets automated just by using, let's say, GitHub Actions and, uh, and AVS. Okay, so I think I've talk, uh, talked enough about some uh, theory and stuff we did. Embed a custom UI kit in a project like this. In our case, uh, that would be, uh, yeah, we have an issue, okay. Basically, uh, if you don't know, yeah, again, if you don't know, uh, keynotes sometimes break and you have to go through all the applications to, 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 to go out, so it happened live, yay. Uh, okay, so what we wanna do, you see a similar button like three times in a row now. Uh, what we wanna do now is apply a custom UI kit to have it uh, styled accordingly. I'll just see if I'm on the right branch, I am, okay. Okay, uh, in order to, let's say, embed Chakra in your application, uh, let me go to my component, uh, what you'll have to do is basically you'll just have to provide or use a chakra provider from their library, uh, pass a team, and everything works. Well, it doesn't. As you can see, we have a team. If I uh, go through styles, I have some custom style for a button, which are not so important, but just to display it. But it doesn't work. Why? You've heard it like two times already and that's because of uh, encapsulation. So by default, Chakra UI, I said, uses emotion, and by default, emotion injects all the styles globally or in your head element. So if I had here, you'll see all the styles I defined and defaults from the Chakra will be injected in the head, and of course, that can be passed down to, to our uh, widget since it's encapsulated. To avoid that, so we'll use a cache provider. What is cache provider? Well, one more provider, which is now being held, handled by emotion. So I'm gonna uh, import it from the emotion. And what a cache provider accepts, a value, they call it a, we'll call it a cache. What it does? Well, it basically says, okay, embed all the styles in this element. So what we can do with that, we can say, okay, embed all the motion or chakra styles inside the shadow DOM as we did uh, manually with plain CSS whatsoever. And then you can provide it like a key, which can be whatsoever. For example, if you have multiple emotion themes or styles that you wanna differentiate, you'll create different caches with different keys so they don't interfere uh, with itself. Not important here, but yeah. 
just to explain it and voila it works so if i refresh you can see that head doesn't have any uh chakra or emotion styles and if i inspect any of our buttons you'll see that styles are being now added here they don't leak out and your style can be or your team can be uh, used uh, within the web component. So you can embed material UI, whatever you want, uh, but you have to find a way to embed your styles uh, inside the Shadow DOM like we did uh, with, with Chakra. Yay, fonts. Uh, now I'll show you how we can use custom fonts in our application. And let me try to go out. Yeah, it works. Uh, okay, I'm lazy of writing the code from the beginning. I'll just go to fonts force rate okay we have all what we need here okay the button looks nice and fancy uh, okay let's add custom fonts we have if I go to index SS we have a custom fonts component which does what well basically it loads font, fa font faces inside your app and then in our counter we will just say okay use family font family roboto and it should apply so if we are following the practices from the styles so what we need to do we need to inject the styles inside the shadow dom in order to be uh, used well no uh, in case of font faces i'm not sure if this is a bug or a feature or both bug and a feature but in order for fonts to work font faces have to be defined outside of the shadow dom so if we do this old regular way, so we have our shadow root, we have a fancy hook here uh, to get the shadow root, and we'll try, okay, create an element style, inner HTML, font faces, just append to, uh, to our shadow root, and font should apply. Okay, if I refresh and inspect class, okay, let's go to a computed styles and try to find font family. Okay, we are using Roboto but rendered forms is times. So the font isn't applied. So you can see that, okay, it tries to, it's defined as a font family roboto, but loaded or rendered font is actually times. So easy step to avoid this. Like I said, fonts ha font faces have to be defined outside. So I'll just do document.head append child. So I'll, I won't use shadow root and obviously font changed. So now you can see render font is Roboto. So maybe this will help you. This is something that I would say it took me like two days to find out. So client was happy to pay 16 hours to get custom fonts. Yay. Uh, okay. Uh, next thing in row is events. Okay. I'll try to play. I won't talk about how events work or why. Uh, you've seen uh, Dan implement events, you've seen uh, Philip implement events. I'm going to talk about uh, or answer the question that Dan uh, was kind to pass on me uh, about uh, events and how to maybe do a two-way communication. What client wanted from us is uh, implement a custom error handling in case the vehicle was ineligible for leasing. So when you go on a marketplace page and the vehicle is, for example, too old or uh, being lead or being sold by a Russian company, for example, or whatsoever, our API will check that in a database and just return us error. So not in, your the car is ineligible for, let's say, further flow. And what they wanted us, well, let's enable those clients to either display a custom error handler or display a custom state, or if they don't care, we'll display our own contact us error state. And how we did that, so we, I would, I would say, clashed a few hours to our heads to find a solution, and then we actually read the documentation about uh, dispatch event. And I don't know if you are aware, but dispatch event returns a boolean and it returns a false if the event is cancelable and at least one of the handlers so uh, handlers with call the event called prevent default uh, on the emitted event so what we did we say okay 
we'll do following thing. If we'll emit widget ineligible event or car ineligible, and what your client needs to do, catch the event and call prevent default. If he calls prevent default, will be served by false and we'll know, okay, our flow stops here, they will handle the error state. If, they, if the method returns true, well, they obviously didn't call anything, we'll show our custom, uh, custom uh, error state. So fun little thing, just using the plain uh, dispatch event function. Okay, we're close to end and uh, what I would like you to take from this presentation like tips and suggestions when you are starting a new project is, is following. So client requests. So don't just act as a service provider and try to uh, sell them something. Try to guide them through their requirements. Try to act as a consul, uh, consultant. Also, when you are choosing your technologies, well, Company reasons should company resources and team availability should play the main role in decision making. Just because something is a best fit for React, or just because you don't have a React developer and you have ten of Angular developers, and this is like good React application, let's hire a React developer to build to build something like this. Like no, Angular will fit fit most probably, and you'll see uh, our colleague uh, building such a thing in Angular. Also experience, so pick the stack you are familiar with. Just because BAN is uh, awesome now, it doesn't mean that you have to use it uh, since it works like a charm. So pick something that you are useful. Don't experiment uh, with, uh, with, with such a things. Design, like it said, design will, will most often define or at least ease of decision making. So I'll design our initial view steps basically showed us the way how we could do the code splitting, chunking, lazy loading, etc. And at the end, pick your battles. So don't get blinded by choosing the technology just because it's performant or secure or similar. Well, use common sense uh, when doing some uh, things like that. Don't over-engineer. So if something looks complex, the solution doesn't have to be. So if you've seen the architecture diagram, so it looks super complex. And if you've seen error handling, uh, build configuration, so I don't know, it looks like a button at the end, at least from the code endpoint. Also aim for, for, the, for the long run. So make sure the stack and technologies you are picking are backed by the community. So don't just go and pick any library you see over the NPM since it will fix your problems. Most probably it won't, at least in the long run. And you'll introduce too much techni technical depth which will bite you in the uh, on the end. Also do the research. Uh, I cannot stress this more than enough, so don't skip on discoveries and tech workshops for the sake of the budget. In the long, in the long run, they will most probably turn uh, more as a more investment or they will return your value since you'll probably spend much less time implementing uh, such things. Okay, so we have Dobar Auto SC. This is kind of a car marketplace in Slovenia, which you can buy a car. And there you can find the NLB heat releasing. So basically what we take, we take the all, whole parameters from the, their car marketplace site or from the API, and then we serve you with a card leasing uh, information. So when clicking it, you'll get a model with a couple of fancy uh, sliders and details. Again, GDPR, of course. If you are physical or, lo or uh, other. And then just enter your data and you'll be served by some code which you can take to a leasing company and get your car like leased uh, using few steps so you don't have to go from house to house and see uh, how much it will uh, pay you. Uh, yeah, so uh, at the end, final result is that on this button, we had like almost 20 people working, I would say. Uh, almost, I would say more than 1,000 hours uh, spent. And I would like to thank both Dayan and Darko from the audience. They both worked on this project as well. And if you implement a button uh, with more than 1,000 plus or 2,000 hours, feel free to show me email, send me an email. And uh, yeah, you beat me then.
Okay, thank you. That's all. If you have any questions, feel free to.